Jordan. Today we're going to be reading a short story, Kid's Guide to Divorce by Lori Moore. And then we're going to be looking at some of the themes and analysis and doing a close reading of a few sections from the text. Let's get started. The Kid's Guide to Divorce by Lori Moore. Put extra salt on the popcorn because your mom will say that she needs it because the part where Inger Berman almost dies and the camera does tricks to elongate her torso sure gets her every time. Think, geez, here she goes again with the Kleenexes. She will say thanks, honey, when you come slowly, slowly around the corner in your slippers and robe into the living room with grandma's old used to be salad bowl piled high. I made it myself, remind her, and accidentally drop a few pieces on the floor. Mittens will bat them around with his paws. Mmm, good to replenish those salts. She'll munch and smile soggily. Tell her the school nurse said after a puberty movie once that salt is bad for people's hearts. Booey, she'll say. It just makes it thump. That's all. Thump, thump, thump. Oh, look. She will talk with her mouth full of popcorn. Cary Grant is getting her out of there. Did you unplug the popper? Pretend you don't hear her. Watch Inger Bergman look elongated. Wonder what it means. You'd better check, she'll say. Groan. Make a little tusk noise with your tongue on the roof of your mouth. Run as fast as you can because the next commercial's going to be the end. Unplug the popper. Bring Mittens back in with you because he's mewing by the refrigerator. He'll leave hair on your bathrobe. Dump him in your mom's lap. Hey baby, she'll coo at the cat, scratching his ears. Cuddle close to your mom, and she'll reach around and scratch one of your ears, too, kissing your cheek. Then she'll suddenly lean forward, reaching toward the bowl on the coffee table, careful so as not to disturb the cat. I always think he's going to realize faster than he does, your mom will say between munches, hand to hand to mouth. Men can be so dense and frustrating. She'll wink at you. Eye the tube suspiciously. All the bad guys will let Cary Grant take Ingmar Berman away in the black car. There will be a lot of old-fashioned music. Stand and pull your bathrobe up on the sides. Hang your tongue out and pretend to dance like a retarded person at a ball. Roll your eyes. Waltz across the living room with exaggerated side-to-side -side motions banging into the furniture. Your mother will pretend not to pay attention to you. She will finally say in a flat voice, how wonderful, gee, you really send me. When the music is over, she will ask you what you want to watch now. She'll hand you the TV guide. Look at it, say, the late, late chiller. She'll screw up one of her eyebrows at you. But say, please, please, in a soft voice, and put your hands together like a prayer. She will smile back and sigh. Okay. Switch the channel and return to the sofa. Climb under the blue afghan with your mother. Tell her you like this beginning cartoon part the best, where the mummy comes out of the coffin and roars, Chiller! Get up on one of the arms of the sofa and do an imitation. Your hands like claws, your elbows stiff, your head slumped to one side. Your mother will tell you to sit back down, snuggle back under the blanket with her. When she says, which do you like better, the mummy or the werewolf? Tell her the werewolf is scary because he goes out at night and does things that no one suspects because in the day he works in a bank and has no hair. What about the mummy, she'll ask, petting mittens. 
shrug your shoulders, fold in your lips, say, the mummy's just the mummy. With the point of your tongue, loosen one of the chewed pulpy kernels in your molar. Try to swallow it, but get it caught in your throat and begin to gasp and make horrible retching noises. <coughs> it will scare the cat away. Good God, be careful, your mother will say, thwacking you on the back. Here, drink this water. Try groaning root beer, root beer, like a dying cowboy you saw in a commercial once. But drink the water anyway. When you're no longer choking, your face is less red and you can breathe again. Ask for a Coke. Your mom will say, I don't think so. Dr. Atwood said your teeth were atrocious. Tell her Dr. Atwood is for the birds. What do you mean by that? She will exclaim. Look straight ahead, say, I don't know. The mummy will be knocking down the telephone poles, lifting them up and hurling them around like Lincoln logs. Wow, all wrapped up and no place to go, your mother will say. Cuddle close to her and let out a long, low, admiring, neato. The police will be in the cemetery looking for a monster. They won't know whether it's the mummy or the werewolf, but someone will have been hanging out there, leaving little smoking piles of bones and flesh that even the police dogs get upset and whine at. Say something like, gross out, and close your eyes. Are you sure you want to watch this? Insist that you are not scared. There's a rock concert on Channel 7, you know. Think about it. Decide to try Channel 7, just for your mom's sake. Somebody with greasy hair who looks like Uncle Jack will be saying something boring. Your mother will agree that he does look like Uncle Jack, a little. A band with black eyeshadow on will begin playing their guitars, stand and bounce up and down like you saw Julie Steinman do once. God, why do they always play them down at their crotches, your mom will ask. Don't answer. Simply imitate them. Throwing your hair back and fiddling bizarrely with the crotch of your pajama bottoms. Your mother will slap you and tell you you're being fresh. Act hurt. Affect a slump. Pick up a magazine and pretend you're reading it. The cat will rejoin you. Look at the pictures of the food. Your mom will try to pep you up. She'll say, look. Pat Benatar, let's dance. Tell her you think Pat Benatar is stupid and cheap. Say nothing for five whole minutes. When the B-52s come on, tell her you think they're okay. Smile sheepishly. Then the two of you will get up and dance like wild maniacs around the coffee table until you're sweating and whooping to the ooh-ah-oohs jumping like pogo sticks, acting like space robots. Do razzmatazz hands like your mom at either side of your head. During a commercial break, ask for an orange soda. Water or milk, she will say, slightly out of breath, sitting back down. Say shit. And when she asks, what did you just say? Sigh, nothing. Next is Rod Stewart singing on a roof somewhere. Your mom will say, he's sort of cute. Tell her Julie Steinman saw him in a store once and said he looked really old. Hmm, your mother will say. Study Rod Stewart carefully. Wonder if you can make your legs go like that. Plan an imitation for Julie Steinman. When the popcorn is all gone, yawn, say, I'm going to bed now. Your mother will look disappointed, but she'll say, Okay, honey. She'll turn off the TV. By the way, she'll ask hesitantly, like she always does. How did the last three days go? Leave out the part about the lady. And the part about the beer. Tell her they went all right. That he's got a new silver dartboard. And that you went out to dinner. And this guy named Hudson told a pretty funny story about peeing in the hamper.
ask for a 7-up. Okay, now we're going to get into some closer line-by-line -line reading and set off on some of the themes and analysis of this text. First off, we noticed Kid's Guide to Divorce is a hint that this is like an instruction manual or guidelines for how to do, right? It's step by step of things we're supposed to do. So the first sentence is telling us what to do. This is really odd in fiction. We don't often have a story that's full of imperative sentences giving us orders and commands. Put extra salt on the popcorn. Think. Tell her. Pretend. Groan. The story is telling us how to do these things. And the whole thing is in the second person. Pretend you don't hear. Cuddle close to your mom. And by putting this story in the second person and filling it with imperative sentences that tell us how to do or how to feel, what Laurie Moore is doing is trying to recreate in her reader and audience this experience of being a young person with her single mother after a recent divorce. So learning to live again without a family, without the father in the household. We get these bits where we kind of peer into the narrator's head. Groan, unplug the popper, cuddle close. All these moments where you see what the kid is thinking. And there's an other hint about what the kid, the narrator, who we are and we're empathizing with, wants or sort of suspects. Over and over again, she's asking her mom for a sweet soda, right? So this is kind of her desire. Try groaning, root beer, root beer. Ask for a Coke. Then later on, after they do a dance, during a commercial, ask for an orange soda. Then right at the end, she finishes, ask for a 7-Up. It's this hint from Moore that the kid kind of understands you can take advantage of your parents a little bit if they're at this low moment, if they've just gone through a divorce. After you butter your mom up a bit by making her popcorn and watching a boring old rock concert full of geezers with her, you can get your soda. There's also this nice passage. Moore shows us her narrator trying to put on an act, trying to pull her mother's attention away from the television. And this gets at this idea of a kid who's going through a new phase in life, who's struggling with what it means to be around a depressed or an unhappy mother. Eye the tube suspiciously. Stand and pull up your bathrobe on the sides. Hang your tongue out. Pretend to dance around. Roll your eyes. These are all these methods, these ideas, these ways to try and get the mother to look at you. Moore tries to get her reader to feel that desperation of a powerless child again, of someone who's stuck and has no control over her mom and just wants her mom to look away from the boring old movie and pay attention to her. There's also this nice little bit where Moore puns on the mother, a mum or a mummy, with the character in the chiller movie, the late night horror movie of a mummy like a supernatural being wrapped in bandages. What about mummy, she'll ask, petting mittens. Shrug your shoulders, fold in your lips, say, the mummy's just the mummy. So what's happening here is that the mother is trying to get the daughter to sympathize for her, to feel bad for her. What about the mummy? She's suffering. Aren't you worried about the mummy? And the kid is saying, well, the mummy's just the mummy. She just expects her mother to be her mother and to be there and always be present, available to her. It doesn't dawn on her yet as a child how to sympathize or feel pain or certainly how to empathize for an adult existence going through this uh, difficult time of an emotional or psychological breakup. Then later, there's a, a really telling moment at the end of the story. The child acts. She puts on an act that she's tired and wants to go to bed. But we'll find out later, she's, she's not actually tired. She just is tired of hanging out with her mom, right? She's bored of doing the grown-up things. When the popcorn is all gone, yawn, say, I'm going to bed now. Your mother will look disappointed, but she'll say, okay, honey, she'll turn the TV off. By the way, she'll ask hesitantly, like she always does, how did the last three days go? This is when we can implicitly 
understand that the daughter has just returned from the three days she spent with her father, right? So there's some sort of split custody battle happening in this divorce. And that's probably why her and the mom are having popcorn and getting to stay up late and why she keeps pestering the mom for this treat. She wants her soda. Sometimes she gets treats after she gets returned home from daddy. This idea being that the parents are struggling over her attention or her time. And the daughter tells us, leave out the part about the lady and the part about the beer. Just that single sentence, we understand that her father's dating or seeing a new woman and also that he's drinking. So his way of coping with isn't by eating popcorn or junk food. It's by drinking beers and going on dates with a new woman and trying to forget the past with the mother. Tell her they went all right, that he's got a new silver dartboard and that he went out to dinner and this guy named Hudson told a pretty funny story about peeing in the hamper. So we're getting this hint, this sort of dramatic irony as a reader, that this adult has told a very adult story about getting too drunk and peeing on his laundry. Maybe to the extent that it's not safe for a child to be in this environment at a level of remove, where the daughter is telling it, thinking it's pretty funny. But it's probably not too funny. And then in the very final moment, again, the child asks for a 7-up. This is a really masterly story. There's a lot going on in between the lines and at the level of informal language and the second person and all of it is adding up to create way more depth than there actually is on the surface reading. At a surface reading it's a very short six page story about a mother and a daughter watching TV, snacking on popcorn, hanging out with a cat and having a little late night dance. But there's all these layers buried in all the implicit meaning beneath the explicit meaning. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was The Kid's Guide to Divorce by Lori Moore. Thanks so much for watching and take care until the next time.